And so we need to, to sort of understand the business of allocating the spectrum that regulators and legislators do in order to support you know, this new form of interaction with each other and with our technology. So spectrum, briefly, <laughs> Electromagnetic, it's like, I mean, the, the paper goes into sort of describing what spectrum is and what the choices are in terms of how, how it's utilized and, uh, and all that. So I'm not going not gonna to get into that right now for the definition. And how do we manage spectrum rights is actually the critical question for policy. The traditional way was for regulators to assign particular patches of spectrum, <coughs> which is to say a right to use the electromagnetic spectrum in a particular place at a particular power level in a particular frequency at a particular time. And it led us to the fragmentation that's evident in this map. And of course, inefficient allocation creates scarcity in some places and creates abundance in others. And so it gets the difficulty in when we undertake this problem statically is that coming up with, a, with a, an assignment of rights that is understandable uh, and is stable enough that for most investment people are, that people are willing to build networks that consist of 100,000 towers uh, within the United States. Um, but also has the flexibility to adapt to changes in the way that, that people are using the system. And uh, the completely static methodology is sort of not really doing that for us. So um, in looking at the different controversies around spectrum that, that, are, that really come down in the last couple of years and, and the things that seem to be in the pipeline, it occurred to me that um, Every spectrum allocation decision is a trade-off. Policymakers aren't necessarily aware, or certainly the, the orders don't indicate that they're fully aware of all the trade-offs that are involved. There are certain factors that you're going to optimize whenever you see when a policymaker makes a particular decision to say assign uh, the D block to public safety. Uh, they're optimizing and creating certain opportunities, but they're denying others. And in looking through these trade-offs, it, 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 uh, it occurred that the thing to do is to isolate what the primary trade-offs are, to describe them, and then we can actually start to use principles of sound spectrum reallocation as a means for grading decisions that are being made now and in the future that affect uh, spectrum rights. And so these are basically the 10 principles. Um, and I'll, I'll go into those in a little bit more detail. Now sharing, obviously, I think sharing and the sort of, they're not necessarily rank ordered, but sharing is certainly high on the list. Um, and most desirable allocations are those that can be shared by it large numbers of people. Now, within the spectrum policy discourse, spectrum sharing has come to mean, I think for a lot of people, one network sharing the same piece of spectrum with another network. But, you know, there, there's another kind of sharing that's so obvious that it, I think it kind of misses the, our attention, and that is that when a, a commercial network operator has a license, has an exclusive license to a particular patch of spectrum. The issuing of that license doesn't prevent the spectrum from being shared. In fact, it actually enables that spectrum to be shared by the, say, 100 million customers that Verizon and AT&T have each. Right. So networking, communication doesn't take place unless there's some sharing. I can't call you on the telephone and, and make sense out of what you're saying unless your phone and my phone share some piece of equipment somewhere in the path between the two of us. So when, when uh, the advantage 
from a technology standpoint of issuing an exclusive license is that the holder of that license actually has the ability because they, there's some their access to that spectrum is deterministic they have to worry about um, interference caused by natural sources caused by sunspots and you know other kinds of electromagnetic activity um, they have to worry about <coughs> the variations in usage that, that their customers experience. But they don't have to compete with another operator for, for access to that spectrum. So they know how much they have. They can implement mechanisms to share it. They can share it actually up to about 95% effectiveness. So that's, that kind of sharing is something we don't want to ignore. And uh, similarly, so so these large characters <coughs> basically are, are sharing one hertz per user across a large, you know, data, a, a large set of users and, and achieving great results with it. By contrast, the over-the-air television system has about 10 hertz per user. And so it's a much less efficient uh, system from, you know, in that way of deciding efficiency. And with Wi-Fi, we have 300 million users in the U.S., more or less, that use Wi-Fi using more or less 300 megahertz of spectrum. So it's, it, it comes out about the same, although that, that's a completely opposite paradigm, because in Wi-Fi, everybody that owns a Wi-Fi access point is a network operator. So that is an example of the kind of sharing of rights you know, to the spectrum, because basically nobody has rights to Wi-Fi spectrum, so everybody has. So uh, we want effective sharing, and these, these are two examples that achieve it, and for, and for a rather coherent set of reasons that we explained. We want application flexibility. One of the drawbacks of that spectrum map is that every one of those little color patches in the spectrum map actually represents an application. And so it's like uh, mobile telephones is one application, aeronautical uh, testing is an application. Taxes are an application. But you know, when, when you think, and, and sort of at the time that those decisions were made, that that logic made perfect sense. But you know, now we've we come to understand that actually a lot of these applications are doable over a common network. And to the extent that we can reduce the number of networks uh, by making every network support multiple applications, then that's a win. And in, um, in the case of Wi-Fi and in LTE, we have two networks that are both based on internet protocol. So there's a high degree of commonality in terms of the applications that they support because of internet protocol. So we want to emphasize application flexibility. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, one of, one of the, the, the sort of principal inefficiency problem with spectrum reallocation is the fact that some allocations are not being used very heavily and others are used over heavily. And so bringing those allocations into balance, and, and in fact, with LTE, the ability to deal with different channel widths, the, the ability to take a chunk of spectrum and then divide it up in different ways is one of the design principles that's built into LTE. Um, and with Wi-Fi, I mean, that is sort of with 11N, uh, the data rate for 11N basically increases about four times over the previous mechanisms. The primary way that that's done, other than, well, there's a protocol quirk that, for packet aggregation that does about half of it, and the other half is simply choosing wider channels. So it's just using more spectrum. So instead of every Wi-Fi user using 20 megahertz, they use they could use 40 when it's available, um, which it never is in the 2.4 megahertz uh, gigahertz band, but it all, pretty much always is in 5.8. So dynamic reallocation within the system, we want to be able to upgrade the technology. I, I think this is probably the principal failing in the traditional way of, of spectrum allocation was that there wasn't any any policy built into those decisions that said, well, this uh, taxi radio system that we're supporting in 1930 is not really going to be state of the art in 1940. 
And in fact, we're probably going to be able to accomplish this goal a lot better as time goes on. So we need to sort of put the spectrum out there in a certain way, but then be able to bring it back and reallocate it. Uh, the best, probably the, the best example of that is the, is the digital TV transition. So when we converted the analog TV system to digital, we reduced its bandwidth requirement by roughly a half and also increased the quality of the transmission. Although the programming isn't necessarily any better than <coughs> Although some, you know, some people actually argue that we're in a golden age of TV because of the shows like Mad Men, the AMC, the, the sort of, we have more producers of television programming than we've had before. And that's because of case. Aggregation efficiency, whenever you, whenever you uh, a regulator assigns, say, a little small piece, like a 50 kilohertz size piece, a spectrum for one application, and then right next to that assigns spectrum for a different application has different characteristics in terms of power levels. They have to reserve an unused uh, border in between those two allocations called the guard band that, that basically takes away its just dead space. And it's just there for protection. We want to minimize uh, those guard bands so that we can make better use. Uh, and obviously, we want facilities-based competition as the, uh, the hallmark of our broadband policy in the United States and has been since the 96 Telecom Act. Um, although some people don't think it's working, you could argue that it certainly is based on the fact that, say, in 2000, uh, Nine, Akamai ranked the U.S. 22nd in average internet connection speed, and in last year we're up to 13th. So jumping from 22nd to 13th, even in a country that wants to be number one in everything, um, is certainly a movement in the right direction. 70% of the LTE users in the world are in the United States right now, and LTE is. Aside from radio technology improvements, LTE is the first time that cellular system has had internet protocol as an essential component of it. So the way that the, before LTE, internet access was sort of an afterthought in the cellular network. With LTE, it's primary. And so that's the convergence of cellular and internet technologies. It's a huge thing. Um, and the United States is leading the world in LTE adoption. And we don't, you know, we don't care about that so much. <clears throat> but with uh, <clears throat> the problem with facilities-based competition in wireless space is because spectrum is the critical input into the wireless economy, spectrum is a limited resource. On the one hand, if we wanted to have the absolutely most efficient, effective use of all the spectrum, we would only have one cellular operator. They could, because all these factors of aggregation efficiency and uh, sharing across multiple users and all that stuff would be optimized if you just had one big carrier. Maybe we could call it Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> but uh, that's obviously achieving, you know, the, the total efficiency is not the only goal. You also want consumers to have low prices. You want to have competition between <coughs> carriers. You want to have an incentive to adopt new technology <coughs> because I mean that's kind of what we learned from the from the uh, telephone monopoly era was that uh, when you you sanction the monopoly, whatever the services that you have in place when the monopoly is sanctioned, those are pretty much going to be the same set of services that you have 50 years down the road, which is you know what happened with it's what happened with telephones, it's what happens with electricity. <coughs> what happens with water and sewer, you know, so that shouldn't be a surprise. So we need to have enough, we need to have enough competition, uh, we need to allocate to enough different network operators so that we have effective competition. Uh, high performance receivers are finally starting to receive some attention for a long time. The total uh, specification for a uh, spectrum right 
was on the transmitter side. It said if you're transmitting, your waveform has to look a certain way, your energy contours have to look a certain way, your, 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 your antenna can point the way, you know, just in one way. And we learned <clears throat> from the, or we should have learned, I'm not sure that we learned anything from the light squared model, but what we should have learned from light squared is that a receiver, um, people who build receivers that are listening to more stuff than they're supposed to be listening to um, can come before the FCC and other, and other regulators and say, his system breaks my system. And so well, the reason that his system breaks your system is because you're listening <laughs> To you know, to what he's uh, to what he's transmitting, you're, you're really not supposed to be listening to those frequencies. But then the, the counter argument is, well, the rules don't say I can't. And so it's kind of like complaining that your neighbor's having a loud party, but you've actually got your ear to your neighbor's window, and you're you know over on his property and, and being disturbed by his loud party. So that's kind of what was going on there. Yeah. <laughs> Use all relevant dimensions. The uh, the map is all just about frequencies. But uh, <coughs> even even if we're just looking at the transmit side, it's not just a question. It's not all frequencies. It's also time. It's the direction of transmission. It's power levels. And uh, as there's more digital content in our radio systems today than there has been before, uh, in the digital domain, there's a whole lot of engineering trade-offs that can be used in terms of how bits are represented on the air, the modulation and coding systems that actually would enable transmissions to take place on the same patches of frequency in the same locations without discernible interference. Power levels have to be similar. So we want to promote new technologies. This is kind of a redundant rule, but it's so important I wanted to say it twice. And we can actually use rules modification rather than a brand new allocation to enable a, a technology to come to market. For example, um, Sprint has some 800 megahertz spectrum that was allocated to uh, push to talk. And I want to use the <coughs> LPE on it. But the way the rules on that were written, it was actually in little tiny uh, chunks of uh, in the, some, in some number of kilohertz that we got. 25 kilohertz, see, um, and 25 kilohertz isn't enough to really do anything with LTE, so they just erased, they just changed the rules on it. Didn't have to give it to a different party. Developing redeployment opportunities. Um, so the, the story of Spectrum today is, you know, for a long time, the story of Spectrum policy was allocation or deployment. Today it's redeployment, because basically, it, the frequencies that have the most interest for two-way mobile communication between 500 megahertz and, and either three or four gigahertz, depending on who you talk to, have already been assigned. So now it's a question of reassigning them. And the uh, redeployment of the spectrum that has been allocated, a uh, couple of examples over the air television, <coughs> basically any, any service that's a uh, two-way service that's satellite-based, that just didn't pan out. You don't want to do two-way services over a satellite except as the final um, fallback after all the more desirable ways have been exhausted. Um, so in the DTV transition, we found that doing a technology upgrade, which is actually pretty massive when you think about it, right? All the television sets that had to be uh, not, not necessarily replaced, but in principle they really had to be replaced, either replaced or front-ended by a converter box. Um, that was a huge undertaking, but it, it's an undertaking where it was the new digital technology that enabled the spectrum to be freed up and also improved the service for everybody, so it's something we couldn't really say no to. So uh, uh, one of the stories from the Olympics, uh, other than the opening ceremony in the, in the, uh, the men's road racing bicycling event, there were one of the few events in the Olympics that people could go to without buying a ticket. So a million spectators came out to watch the event. 
And the commentary on it was particularly bad. I mean, most people probably don't watch a whole lot of bike racing. Um, I've been watching it late. A friend of mine was actually the first American to finish in the top 10 in road racing in, uh, ever, in 1976, one of my neighbors. Uh, he works for Falcom, actually, doing wild stuff. You know, some of his George Mount looked him up in Wikipedia. Uh, kind of, kind of, he didn't, he didn't know him. He's going to be really embarrassed if he finds out, so I don't know. Somebody tweet about it, that's what he um, So the commentary was really bad because uh, apparently, especially on BBC, the, the commentators didn't know who was in the lead. They didn't know what the gap was, and the reason was they were depending on a mobile network to deliver that information to them. But these million spectators along the, the route of the race were all taking pictures and, and tweeting and uploading pictures to Facebook, and so the one particular, one of the, the three major mobile networks in the UK was just so overloaded that it couldn't deliver the information to BBC that they needed. The other two were doing this fine. <laughs> uh, and so they actually put out a message and they asked people to not tweet things that, that weren't urgent. <laughs> um, but then they also did realize that they needed to have uh, to switch carriers. So that's what they did for the, for the women's race the next day, which, which went fine. Of course, the rain probably helped a little bit too. But, so, it, so here we have an example of it's spectrum being shared because these, you know, these million spectators are basically all using common facilities, but you know, it still can be overloaded. So the the model, so the, the I want to develop this point a little bit that um, two two ways of thinking about spectrum sharing is sort of we can share spectrum in its raw form which is to say that uh, that's what we do in, in Wi-Fi because we each have the right to be a network operator. So we can also share it in a clip form, which is what we're doing when, you know, when we use our, our cell phones on a network that's provided by a commercial carrier. The, they're both sharing, right? But the, uh, in the Wi-Fi form of sharing, what we have to do is determine on, on uh, packet but because regardless of how we're sharing it, whether it's unlicensed or licensed or in, in the intermediate between licensed and unlicensed, with the technology that we have today, with very few exceptions, in any given place, on any given frequency, at any given time, you can only have one packet at a time that, and still be able to discern. If you have multiple packets at the same time, there's typically going to be what called in Wi-Fi engineering a collision. And so the, the intended recipient of both of those packets basically will not receive anything that can make any sense of it. And in fact, the Wi-Fi system is designed to, to, to test every packet that it receives and then to uh, get it a retransmission if a collision took place. So in a, in a completely unlicensed system like Wi-Fi, what you have to do, every, every potential transmitter has to go sense the state of the network and look for a condition in which no one else is transmitting before he transmits. And in doing that, um, because they, they're not sharing information with each other, the users of the Wi-Fi system, so 30 Wi-Fi users in an office are all trying to, to download uh, the same cat video from YouTube, they don't share with each other the fact that they want to, that they're going to make a request for a, for essentially permission to transmit, which is what you're doing when you're sensing the air before you transmit. That that's going to be followed by another request, and it's going to be followed by another request, and another request, and these things are going to be spaced out at some interval. We don't have a way to share that information with each other, so we're constantly having to, to re-establish what the state of the network is before every packet is transmitted. And the overhead of doing that means that essentially uh, 50 to 75 percent of the network's capacity is devoted, is dead, because potential transmitters are having to, to look for that free network before they can transmit. And the length of time that they have to discover that our 
sense the network can believe that its free corresponds to the physical scope of the network because it's determined by the speed of light. Uh, as the data rate increases, when the data rate increases, the length of time that each packet occupies decreases, but that carrier sensing time does not decrease because the speed of light is not getting any faster. So, they, you know, if there's, an, if there's an inherent inefficiency involved in that. So sharing uh, cook spectrum at high data rates and over large distances is more effective, but at the same time, we don't want a, a regime in which the FCC has to explicitly assign spectrum to every Wi-Fi access point. So that's a fundamental tension. So, However, whatever kind of sharing you're doing, you know, we're still up against the one packet at a time limitation. Now, a big, a big focus of the research since really the advent of CDMA has been developing technologies that allow multiple packets at the same time in the same frequency. And see, I mean, CDMA actually achieves that, but there's a, there's a trade-off because of the way it achieves it. And some of the research suggests, however, that uh, it may be possible, in fact, in a couple of demonstrated systems using a technique called orbital angular momentum, we can actually achieve multiple packets at the same time transmission without any loss of effectiveness. And the researchers claim because this is a quantum effect that uh, deals with, with quantum states in, in a system in which there are potentially infinite quantum states, that we could actually have infinite spectrum capacity. But if you can't go by that system today, what the impact that it would have on battery life, uh, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we're, we're probably uh, generating, even if it's all real, and nobody's exaggerating anything like researchers never do, we're still a generation or two away probably from having portable systems, but that that's the kind of sharing that's going to solve the problem, you know, for everybody in the long run. So, so why these particular principles? I mean, that's I think one of the one of the issues that, that we can discuss. I think it's important to have essentially to, to make explicit the trade-offs so that we can look at a particular regulatory action and determine, you know, does it really move us in the right direction? And that's what we're really trying to establish is to set a direction for spectrum policy so we can evaluate how quickly we're, we're moving it. And uh, we certainly want to, you know, avoid all the fads, get the timelines for the research in line with the actual current set of issues and, and the short term, medium term, long term to sort of bring those things into some sort of harmony. There are obviously, uh, obviously going to be errors in this. That someone else might come up with a, with, a, with a set of principles that are more clear anyway, maybe more consistent, maybe more effective. They may be that, uh, building some bias into it. But when, what I tried to do is to establish this on a, on a sound technical and economic basis, and then we can use that to evaluate the controversy. So, in, in the paper, I, I go into uh, several controversies. I, I guess we don't really have time to, to do that and go through these in detail. But um, let me uh, pick a couple of these out that, that probably deserve some attention. The uh, Channel 51 issue relates to building in um, it's the 700 megahertz interoperability. And the, the issue there is whether the large carriers should be required to put support for the small carriers into their LTE handsets. And, and it, it gets into a lot, of, a lot of issues about how we're using channel 51. Uh, you can read the report on that. The 800 megahertz guard bands, I already referred to that. And it's, it's an interesting case because it, it illustrates what you have to do to get a perfect score. And so, and I'm trying to not be like the old East German Olympic judges and just give perfect scores to people who come from the right country. But I guess I'm not accused of that. But 
But I, I mean, that's an example where, where essentially the relaxation of some old regulations ended up moving everything in the right direction. So Sprint got what they wanted in terms of, of LTP. Um, there was an issue with uh, some public safety use that was uh, finessed by the FCC. We ended up with better receivers. We ended up using, uh, I, I guess the use of all relevant dimensions, it, 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 that really should be a neutral. But it enables an old technology to be replaced with a new technology for the spectrum to be used more flexibly for the ch channels to get wider. And uh, and that's all goodness. That's the kind of thing that, you know, that I like to see happen. In the uh, NTIA's report about government uh, spectrum use in the 1755 to 1850 band, there were several examples of military applications, not necessarily in enough detail that we can really um, evaluate them all that well, but there, there were a couple of cases where uh, DOD had has assignments to use microwave backhaul that they used to support training exercises, where I think the, the thing that is missed there is that, you know, not everything that we do with Spectrum has to be done with Spectrum. I mean, at this point in time, we can actually, a lot of the, especially where microwave is, microwave is sort of a virtual wire anyway. And so you use microwave when it's either too expensive, basically because it's too expensive to pull wire. But if you're supporting a training facility where you, you know you have regular, regular use, enough to warrant an allocation of Spectrum, I would argue that we should consider the, the cost of replacing that spectrum app that instead of using microwave, use fiber. And so we pull some fiber, some of that fiber can actually be used to support the public's uses and some of it also supports training exercise. So let's think about some of those applications in terms of whether they need any spectrum at all. Um, so in both of these tactical radio relays a similar, similar situation. So you can get a perfect score by simply that's not making that a spectrum map anymore. Converting video surveillance that the uh, the FBI, Treasury, the IRS have 130 megahertz for video surveillance. We talked about this the last in the last panel where everybody beat up on NTIA over that, which is, I guess, why NTIA didn't want to be represented on the panel today. It gave them a lot of grief over it. But if it turns out what's actually happening there is that an awful lot of those video surveillance systems use analog TV cameras. And so if they simply took those analog TV cameras uh, and converted them to digital, they would reduce their spectrum footprint. They'd also be in a position where they could use a commercial network or a Wi-Fi network or something that sort of looks normal as the, as the backhaul, which actually kind of wouldn't tip off the crooks quite as well as the current system they have. So it waste spectrum that uses obsolete equipment and it tips off the crooks. So that's a really, when you get a, and the way these, these scores came out that anything that basically a plus six, you can go from minus 10 to plus 10. So if you're above plus six, you're in the right area. Uh, it's actually difficult in a lot of these, these controversial cases to uh, achieve a 10. Now, PCAST, uh, I graded, I like PCAST report so much, I graded it twice. But actually, when the, when the report was initially written, the, the final PCAST report wasn't out. So it's based on, uh, this grading is based on the ideas that were in the PCAST update, which is a slide deck that was released before the report was final. And, and the thing about the PCAST, uh, PCAST report is that PCAST basically describes the problem, where you have, uh, there's essentially well over a thousand megahertz of spectrum that is currently supporting government applications. Um, almost all of it <clears throat> using technologies that are quaint, if not obsolete. Um, and, and then, so the question is, how do you how do you have 
how do you incentivize, how do you motivate government to release some of that spectrum to uses that the public can take advantage of? So this is as much a political problem as it is a technical and economic problem. And so they describe, a, in, the, in the update, they describe there's sort of a, a pyramid of uh, uses where at the peak of the pyramid, you have a primary government user. And then in the middle, in the middle, uh, they contemplate a licensed secondary use. And then at the bottom, an unlicensed tertiary use. Um, and I, I like that because it, Certainly, the, a licensed secondary use, I think, enables uh, a lot of those free. And it also turns out that the government was smart enough to jump on the best frequencies early on. So they're, they're using an awful lot of, of spectrum in the, in the uh, from, say, 1,500 megahertz to uh, 3,400, which is the same spectrum that, that we want for mobile, mobile networks. So they're smart enough to get on that. The update suggests a way, or it seems to, to emphasize the uh, a set of motivations and a system that would allow commercial use of, the, of that spectrum. And, and I think with some of these allocations where they're not using it very heavily at all, the opportunity for using it commercially, I think, is, is very is very great. Uh, but then, when the final report came out. And actually, this is a typo. The total score should be a two. It shows I don't do arithmetic. You know, I think we had the same typo in the report, but uh, I tried to get that changed. It it was just sort of the. I talked to, to Mark Warnberg, who was the, the guy that led the development of the report, and he said, "Well, so your objective are body language, uh, not to what we're saying, because the." Um, they're trying to tread a fine line where there's an understanding that there's kind of a, a clash of uh, interests. I mean, certainly, Defense Department, you know, has a very important mission, right? Uh, we don't want to just say you're going to have to do a bake sale every time you build a bomber. I mean, it's not, it's not that. That's not what I'm proposing, but. The same kinds of incentives that work in the commercial private sector don't work in the government sector. So you, how, do you, how do you motivate the Defense Department to replace an aging system with a more up-to-date system? And how do you, how do you encourage uh, a government department that has free spectrum today to uh, just give up their free spectrum and replace that with a system where they have to pay, make payments to use you know, AT&T or Verizon's network? I mean, and that's that's tough. Yeah, that's a tough problem. What's the argument for that? Um, and so that we get into all these different ways to finesse that, which uh, might include the, the proposal that we made for the public safety network, which is to essentially allocate some spectrum as a public safety networking endowment, and then sublease that spectrum to commercial operators and use the revenues from the subleasing to pay for the cost to mitigate the cost of providing the service. So that we don't know just because the government department or government application needs to use a network doesn't mean that it has to be the operator. Doesn't mean that it has to have its own network of towers. Doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that it needs to provide its own backhaul. And, and of course those issues with the public safety network are, are actually going to become critical between now and the time that the thing is actually implemented. And it, and it could very well be that the best way to use that spectrum is to uh, sub-license it to Metro PCS, for example, and then um, pay a monthly fee for the use of it. So in, in the spectrum superhighway, it seemed to be a little bit too enthusiastic about dynamic sharing at the raw spectrum level. And, and there was also a, a statement in it at the very beginning that says that the current system of, of clearing users off of an old allocation and then so we could repurpose spectrum for a new use was not sustainable. 
And I look through the report to see the see the work on that, you know. It's like, you know, the, the, your algebra teacher that says, show me your work. I didn't see where they did the work on that non-sustainability claim. Uh, I didn't even see a definition of sustainability. So what does it mean? Clearly, we can't just sort of go kicking federal users off the spectrum and then use that as the, the only mechanism that we use to alleviate the spectrum crunch. But certainly repurposing some, some of this spectrum that is currently assigned to very inefficient and aged systems into more up-to-date, more efficient systems is, is a critical part of the overall thing. So that, that was primarily what I objected to. Um, and, and the PCAS folks uh, have told me that, well, depending on I me, mean, we actually tried to achieve the, the set of 10 goals, and they believe the report does a whole lot better job than the, the grading that I gave it uh, would, would give it. And by their grading, it's about a nine. So there, you know, there, there is some subjectivity, clearly, there's a lot of subjectivity, and, and, and the question is, you know, with any sort of government report, so if, if what they had done was design a mechanism, we still have to grade the outcome of the use of the mechanism, rather the mechanism itself is sort of policy neutral. So they designed with this, with a uh, geolocation database, that could be used for good purposes or bad purposes, sort of like, you know, atomic energy. Um, and we're making, we have to make predictions about what's going to come out of that. Lights were just GPS, we already talked about that. The, the problem I have with medical body area networks is that I think it's just uh, same old, same old. It's the way spectrum, it's a, it's a particular application. The FCC is given this particular application and only that application. Uh, the right to use the spectrum to connect sensors in hospitals to uh, hospital infrastructure. And, you know, I'm thinking when, when I ride my bike, I wear a heart rate monitor that uh, connects by Bluetooth to the uh, exercise app in my cell phone that's strapped to my elbow or my shoulder. And the FCC didn't have to, that heart rate monitor doesn't get privilege, but it, its cousin the heart rate monitor in a hospital actually gets privilege. And I don't see the logic for that. Uh, spectrum post transaction is in here too. So then, then after all this, we, I go into the, the research about sort of two main branches of spectrum research. One that, that allocate that deals with allocation efficiency, which is the software defined radio cognitive radio area. And then the other stuff, which I've already alluded to, about usage efficiency, which gives you more bits per hertz and simultaneous access. So you should read the report. Obviously, it's only 56 pages, but a lot of that's pictures. <laughs> uh, one response. So, so now we're gonna. I'm gonna hear what I did wrong. Hopefully. Uh, one, response, one guy who read it had a response, couldn't be here with uh, Marty Cooper, the cell phone pioneer. Uh, spelled my name right. Uh, and uh, he's, a, he's a big proponent of dynamic spectrum access, and especially spatial division, multiple access. And Marty points out that SDMA is actually in use and is serving millions of people around the world. It's a, it's a way that essentially focus radio beams and they combine them with some clever coding so that you get more simultaneity. And so you know, you know how I said only, you only get one back at a time? Well, with SDMA, it's not necessarily true. It's, it's a way that you can actually achieve. But they, <coughs> what it does is it reduces the space. So. We have multiple packets in what used to be an area that can only afford, that can only support one packet at a time. And Marty's a big fan of probably the radio technology, but he believes it's 10 years away uh, from practicality. And that's his important. So, that's it. And uh, I survived, I've talked too long, but. Now I think we can hear from our respondents, and I think probably the best way to do that is just just go in order. Fantastic. We're gonna do a speed round, right, guys? 
speed round. All right, three three quick points. Richard first. Well, we have the room for another 35 minutes. So. Okay, we can, I could do my part somewhat quickly. Uh, 32 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> 32, that's divided by that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Richard, first of all, thank you and ITIF for inviting me uh, to the panel. I'm happy to be here. Looking forward to comment. Um, Morgan, I wish you had shared with me the no tie rule. I would be much happier without a tie on. And uh, John, I want to make sure you pay particular attention to uh, Richard's point about clearing channel 51 as a plus eight. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think any time that we have a paper or a panel on looking at spectrum allocation, spectrum assignment, uh, spectrum efficiency, we're, we're winning, right, as a, as a wireless industry and as a country. Once we look at these issues, put them front and center, and begin to have a discussion on them, I think that's a positive. Uh, looking at sort of taking what Richard presented and taking it up to about the 20,000 foot level, I kind of look at it like uh, the Robert Parker of Spectrum Review, right? He, he's giving a grade to uh, each. Not, not everyone will agree with the grade. Not everyone will even agree with the concept of grading. And yet I think most people will agree that Robert Parker brought some benefit to the wine review industry, at least for people like me who like to drink it and, and buy it. Um, and so when I looked at it, I kind of looked at it in that context. What, what was Richard's goal was to try to present some way of analyzing different sort of puts and takes in, in the spectrum space. Um, and, and uh, you know, I have to say, I most quickly zeroed in on his thoughts about, about the PCAS report, because it's occupied a fair amount of my uh, thought process recently, trying to get a sense of, of what, was, uh, what was being presented, uh, what was actually in the over 100 pages of the, of the PCAS report. And um, to some extent, I agreed with what, what Richard presented with regard to PCAST. I, I agreed that, as I said earlier, that there's really a benefit to try to, try to be forward-looking and try to um, you know, spend some time thinking about what the future will look like and will hold. And uh, when Mark and Preston came to present it to me, um, I think it was presented in one light. I, I, I've since really looked at it in a different light. Um, and, and I'll talk a moment about that. But, you know, as I look at whether it's Richard's analysis of the PCAS report or the report itself, I, I think there's, at its core, a fundamental flaw. And, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit again. It's sort of a 25,000 foot, foot flaw. But um, if you look at the, at the entities who participated in the development of this report, you have um, 16 academics, you have three venture capital uh, representatives, you have um, uh, two consulting companies, and then you have four companies or corporations. None of those four companies represent entities that either operate a network or build components of a network. So, so at its core, you were trying to sort of decide, the PCAS was, what was the best way to take advantage of, of government spectrum and, and sort of bring it to market? And I, I, I think, arguably, to address the president's call, his memorandum and call for 500 megahertz of spectrum. And, and as I looked at the analysis, and Richard uh, sort of at least uh, talked about this or touched on it a little bit, he, he said there wasn't much of sort of a business case, that there wasn't a lot of, of support behind uh, the conclusions. And, and my concern, and the reason why I mentioned sort of who made up the, the group, is that there, for me, the, what the president said, and I, and I, and I would argue that argue that, that perhaps the PCAS report doesn't address the president's call in his, uh, in his memorandum for 500 megahertz. And in fact, sort of takes a completely different approach and, and sort of puts the presidential memorandum off to the side and says, here's how we would do it. If you look at the president's memorandum, it was built on the notion of a looming spectrum crisis. What drives that looming spectrum crisis? It's commercial use. License and unlicensed, but, but commercial use, use by customers of wireless broadband. And what the president was suggesting, if I may be so bold, because uh, you know it's not he wasn't alone, right? This is an issue where we have Republican and Democratic House and Senate, uh, White House, FCC. I mean, you can count on maybe three or four fingers the number of, of issues we have that has that sort of really broad consensus. And all of it was driven by whether it's Cisco or any of the other entities out there that were talking about 
sort of the fact that demand was skyrocketing and the supply for spectrum, the pipeline for spectrum was close to you know non-existent. It was there, there was some uh, you know, close to 50 megahertz that was there, but nothing that could be auctioned in the near term. And so the president's goal and the national broadband team's goal was to get 500 megahertz to market. The broadband team actually said 300 megahertz in five years and 510. The president embraced that 500 megahertz. The idea was to bring it in and present it to sort of these commercial entities so that they could let consumers continue to have a very robust, positive, innovative experience. And you look at what came out of the PCAST report, and it is a wholesale revision of how Spectrum is brought to market, how it's utilized by companies, uh, how it's auctions, how it's assigned, how it's you know, licensed or not. And, and part of what they, the PCAST group, I think, built their premise on was the data that we presented about commercial use and commercial needs. And yet I don't think they, they solved that. At least certainly they don't solve that in the near term. And, and uh, to me, the most sort of, I guess, stark element of the report was right up front, first page or two, where they said sharing will be the new norm, has to be the new norm. And what we have suggested is that Everything has to be on the table. You need sharing. You need uh, you know, clearing of networks. You need license. You need unlicensed. You need all of the above. You need changes and upgrades in the technology. And for us, it was key sort of putting everything on the table. Uh, you know, when when uh, Preston and, and Mark and I spoke, I, I made that clear. I made that clear in the New York Times that, that there really needs to be a focus on, on clearing, that the gold standard is still clearing. And if you had a chance to get the, the what we call a flag chart, which we put out on the table, you'll see that every country that we would consider our competitor, or at least someone we would look at to compete with and try to, uh, uh, you know, um, outperform in spectrum, and in, in the wireless ecosystem, gets it and is bringing hundreds of megahertz of spectrum to market in a clear fashion. And so, for me, I think I think the takeaway I would have is. You know, obviously sharing is going to be a key component. We have a number of our carriers and manufacturers in front of the FCC and NTIA right now looking at sharing. And they're looking at this sharing in a in sort of temporal, uh, temporal nature. Uh, you know, X companies or X entities going to use it for you know this many hours, but you can have access the rest of the time. Or a geographic nature. We're going to have a satellite earth station right here, but you can use spectrum around the rest of the, the country. Or they're look, looking at it in a sort of a compatible use. What are, what are two uses that we could put and use simultaneously? Um, going forward, we clearly do need to investigate the intelligence sharing, the cognitive, the, you know, the cognitive approach. And yet, and I think, Richard, you said this in your, in your statement, sort of putting our eggs all in one basket, this idea that the new norm is sharing, I know causes me concern because it's not what the rest of the world is doing. Uh, it certainly isn't going to drive any short-term spectrum to market. And it's something that, that I'm not sure people have presented a real business model or business case for just yet. And that's key not only to address the looming spectrum crisis, but to help sort of lift us out of this economic morass that we're in. It's, it's finding ways to incentivize companies to continue to invest, to continue to drive capital expenditure. So, um, I would say, uh, you know, kudos to Richard and kudos to the PCAS team for, for making us think sort of a little bit outside the box. I like the idea of putting uh, what I call sort of the uh, Robert Parker scoring mechanism to, to some of these spectrum decisions. And uh, I look forward to, I've read the paper, I look forward to hearing some of the other commentary. And, and, I, and I do, I look forward to seeing sort of uh, how the administration continues to move forward uh, as, you know, as we digest, we all digest the PCAS report. I guess I uh, rate your performance square root of two. <laughs> um, so, well, thanks, uh, Richard, for, um, for inviting me. I just want people to go to bureaucratic, bureaucratic blandness between press and press here. Um, I do want to say we do appreciate the perfect score on 800 records and a uh, medal ceremony at some point outside after this. Um, I, think that, I think the idea of having a set of principles to inform effective policy is obviously a good one. Um, you know, principles are a way to kind of give you a sense of where you're going and whether you're making progress along the way. Um, and I think, as I'll sort of come back again, I think, I think we try to do that at the FCC. It may not be sort of etched in stone, but I think the people who work on these types of spectrum issues have a set of 
uh, kind of guiding uh, principles, um, even if they're not always clear to the outside world, which is something we should talk to and prove. Um, we've been doing a lot with Spectrum, uh, and I'll just kind of quickly run through some of the things. We, you know, we are sort of embracing this all of the above approach that uh, people have been talking about. Um, you know, in general, we're working on sort of three parallel paths. We've got a path devoted to removing obstacles to spectrum use, so that's the you know, megahertz band, the uh, AWS four proceeding, the WCS work that's going on. Uh, we're working on, on deploying new tools that are now available to us uh, to find new ways to bring spectrum to market. So, for example, the incentive options is the major effort there. We've got the white spaces uh, work on going. Um, and we're looking at new frontiers and ways to kind of uh, add to our toolbox over time. Uh, so we're looking at spectrum for small cells. Uh, obviously, our, our flexible policy allows small cells in most of the cellular, uh, most of the mobile bands, but having a, a band that may be well suited for small cells, so a low power band. Um, uh, we're looking at sharing. Um, Chris alluded to the, the 1.7 gigahertz work, which is a licensed a form of license license sharing is being explored. Um, there's the 3.5 gigahertz band. Um, and then, uh, Janikowski uh, has said that we're looking at that for small cells and the announcement of the PCAST report. Um, uh, so we'll be looking to um, explore some of the ideas in the PCAST report as the application of that band. Um, and then the 5 gigahertz band, which we know is very important to the unlicensed community as a, as a place for Wi Fi uh, and expanding the usability of Wi Fi. Um, I think we have to remember that, especially for the spectrum that we're talking about mostly here today, the, the you know, below 3 gigahertz, below 4 gigahertz spectrum. It's not a tabular rasa. Um, we're working with bands that have really complicated, complex um, backstories, um, sometimes tortured backstories. And so while I think it's tempting in, you know, especially in these kinds of settings to talk about some of these approaches and concepts in the abstract and which one is better, which one is worse, I think at least the way I look at it personally is um, there are different approaches that work in different contexts and different bands have different sets of facts on the ground that lend themselves uh, in different cases to different types of approaches for making them useful uh, for commercial use. So uh, to give an example, you know, unlicensed was a natural fit in 2.4 gigahertz band, the ISM band. Um, you would not have wanted to put a cellular system in that band. Similarly, cellular was a natural fit in the DTV spectrum, uh, but they did have the DTV <coughs> So our approach, I think, at the SEC is, is pragmatic, uh, fundamentally. Um, we're trying to build on what's worked in the past. We're also trying to uh, allow for innovation for new things to, you know, new approaches to take shape that may be uh, what, you know, is, is needed in the future. Um, as our, our chairman has said, that we are committed to finding free and clear spectrum where we can, uh, and when we can. Um, and we're also excited by the PCAST proposals uh, that I mentioned, the 3.5 gigahertz band. Um, and then, of course, there are in, a lot of room in between, you know, that the, I mentioned this 1.7 gigahertz, that's actually a really interesting uh, new frontier, which is kind of not getting maybe as much public discussion, but there's a lot of people hard work on that. Uh, it's a good example of public-private partnership between industry and government to see if there's a way to make that work. Um, so back to the principles, you know, I, I think, you know, I can't comment on the 10 individual principles, but, you know, I think overall they tend to make sense. You know, we, we tend, to, tend to try to find larger blocks of spectrum rather than scattershot and piecemeal. Uh, spectrum. We try to, you know, um, think about and just try to learn from experience and take the learnings from one band and apply them going forward. And I think you'll see some of that uh, as we um, progress in some of these uh, major initiatives that are underway. But I just want to remind everyone that the SEC, you know, operates under a statutory framework, so there are restrictions on us um, in the law and also in, you know, in an institutional framework. So we have to cooperate with other agencies, and particularly when you're talking about spectrum sharing, that involves the federal agencies, the NTIA, the administration. And there's a lot of partnership and hard work that goes on to making sure that everyone's diverse set of uh, interests uh, can be achieved. So um, with that, I'll pass on the press and let the, the controversy uh, resume. Well, thank you very much, Richard, for inviting me. I don't say so much thank you for giving me five minutes to answer an hour of criticism <laughs> for the PCAS report. I think most of the uh, controversy revolves, and perhaps the best thing <laughs> for people to do is go read the report. Unfortunately, it's much longer than Richard's and it's not as big. But um, the, the fundamental point of departure is really the idea that the PCAS walked away from the idea of free and clear options uh, to go to a totally new regime. And I don't think it really did that. It's completely quiet on free and clear. And in fact, if, if you can make spectrum free and clear, certainly some of the incentive options offer that opportunity. Um, there's nothing in the PCAS report that says don't go do that. 
What it does argue is that you built a bow wave of federal systems that will become increasingly difficult to relocate. Um, the evidence for that we didn't put in the report because who wants to read the NTIA report twice? Once is more than enough for most of us. But, but there's a strong set of arguments, and to some extent, they're, they're just the fact that they're strong arguments is sufficient to say that slogging through those systems to relocate whole bands to, free, to auction them free and clear is going to take you a long time. Um, the National Broadband Plan listed a set of auctions, if you average them out, they're 8.2 years from identifying spectrum to putting it into use. So, so clearly, going to federal bands and saying that's the quick fix for, for pumping spectrum into the system didn't look particularly attractive. It's true there are some areas 1755. I know the cellular industry has a lot of interest in maybe 25 megahertz um, can be done that, that violates that. But that's 5% of the 500 megahertz that the president laid out as the objective and, and not really the relevant. In the end, the report's argument was going and trying to clear whole bands of all possible federal users is extremely difficult, expensive, and time consuming and doesn't put spectrum in. Therefore, make use of the same points Richard made. A lot of federal systems aren't using that spectrum everywhere. DOD uses a lot of spectrum out west. It can't use cellular because when it goes into South Sudan, there won't be cellular there. But when I drive between Las Vegas and LA, my cell phone dies, not because there's no spectrum, but because there's not a whole lot of users out there that want to use it. There's no density problem there. Let the DOD use that spectrum. Don't sell it, don't reallocate it. But in New York City, that spectrum's available right now. Let's get that into the hands of innovators, cellular companies, backhaul, what other applications. The work that the FCC has done on TV white space offered in right now technology of the white space databases that would enable you to put a record out to say, this spectrum's available in the city. Is it the most efficient way? No. Is it as cool as the DSA technology we built at DARPA? No way. But it's something you could do right now it's something that would be effective at putting spectrum in people's hands two and a half times faster. And so the PCAS report said, let's start a different thread for putting spectrum out there. It doesn't walk away from free and clear. If you can do that, great. Uh, everyone appreciates the revenue. Um, everyone appreciates the better QoS. But you've got a lot of spectrum that's not going to fit that model or not going to fit that model in the next decade. And that was really the focus of the PCAS report, is let's find another strategy than slugging it out with the federal agencies. So let's, let's think about what happens if we do that. If we do that, we don't have to fight and say everyone moves. We can go to a particular user of Spectrum and say, if you auction that Spectrum off in this micro-auction, the secondary status, then you create a revenue stream, exactly like what the D-Block proposal that Richard had in endowment. So we can monetize federal spectrum without having to clear all of it. We create a revenue stream on it. We create a way to pay for those upgrades. Or more importantly, something that the spectrum policy, the spectrum relocation fund doesn't really contemplate yet, Matt. Uh, the ability to say, I actually want to trade spectrum for services. And so by, by using spectrum sharing and creating a new class of spectrum right, this exclusive shared access, we create a way to monitorize something today we can't monitorize and then use those funds to feed back into more efficient federal spectrum usage. If CTIA and its members can convince federal agencies that buying is better than in-source in versus outsourcing, then there's a model of how to generate revenue off that spectrum that does that. And it's a model we could do within three years. So I think that's really, the, there's a lot of other, I, I, I don't know how we went. I was so proud of our plus five score. And then when we went to the final, we went down to plus two. But, but I think all of the disagreements really, really focus on that one thing. Um, despite all the academics of the report, in the end, the report was really driven by, by a fundamental pragmatic consideration, that we built a bow wave up of federal systems that are all of the criticisms there. Um, they're all, they're decrepit, they probably have vacuum tubes in them. But they are there, they're not going to leave fast, we don't have the money necessarily to relocate them. Um, but there's a way to make use of all the spectrum they aren't using, rather than focus on the spectrum they are. And I think that's really the point of departure. I think once you get past that one issue, then, then a lot of these other points kind of we can work out in the wash. Thank you. In the interest of time, I'll try to be as quick as possible. Um, at the Energy and Commerce Committee, we have obviously taken a very uh, strong look at spectrum throughout the of Congress. Uh, the incentive auction legislation, we think, is a really good start to a long-term spectrum solution in the commercial space. And now we've turned <clears throat> to look at government spectrum. 
As we've been looking at the PCAST report, and while we're still analyzing and going through some of the things in it, um, we basically have taken a look at it and found that while we think it's a great long-term solution, that it's something that we can look at for the long-term for government users, we don't want the promise of technologies like dynamic spectrum access to hold up opportunities to do actual clearing. And as we've looked at it, and I, I've sort of been thrown back to my law school uh, 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 evidence class. And it, it brings you back to sort of three things. Uh, so on the, on the technical side, I would say that you know, it lacks a proper foundation. Um, there seem to be a number of things in the report that assume that there is commercial viability for these pieces of technology that we have not seen come to fruition in the commercial space. Um, a number of us lived through ultra wide and saw those rules fought over and fought over and fought over, and ultimately didn't get a viable commercial industry yet. Um, as we move forward, we'd like to be able to see that there is some justification for some of the statements in the report, like these are now available or will be available in the short future. Um, looking at the, the economic space, I think it assumes facts, not amendments. Um, it assumes that there is a market for a piece of spectrum where you are sharing with unlicensed on the bottom end, and you may or may not get access from government on the top end. I think we've, we have some experience with this type of right structure, and we saw it in the 700 megahertz D block. We asked the commercial industry to go to auction and bid on spectrum rights that were subordinate to public safety. It didn't work. No one was willing to pay for it. Here, we're asking for an even more stringent test. We're asking for commercial providers to purchase spectrum rights subordinate to national security and sharing with unlicensed users. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure that there's evidence in this paper, in the PCAT paper, that shows for us that there's an economic viability to that model, that someone's going to step up and invest the billions of dollars it takes to build out a mobile wireless broadband network in that space. Um, and, and lastly, you know, I'm sort of like the last one is hearsay, which is the, the, the justification for us saying that we can't do clearing in the short term, it's not politically viable, it's not technically viable, is the NTIA report. The NTIA report, as they stated before our committee, is based with no analysis on what the agencies have told NTIA is their spectrum need. Um, GAO did a report on this sort of path, and, and we've seen that there's no one really checking to see whether the agencies are using spectrum in the smallest footprint they need. Um, and until we sort of go back and, and take a hard look at the analysis that underlies the foundation of why we are saying we should stop looking at 500 megahertz for reallocation and start looking at 1,000 megahertz for sharing, I think we should look at whether or not we can make our, uh, our first plan work instead of sort of rolling the dice on an untested technology uh, as what we're banking our wireless future on. I think I've seen those solutions. Um, when Richard invited us, he sent us an email that said, uh, I'll begin by introducing everyone and presenting a 15 minute summary of the paper. Uh, I know, it probably seemed like an hour, but uh, and if he can do that with time, why can't he do it with <laughs> Um So I will continue with also analogy. Um, you know, I'm just really glad that, that these issues are being discussed in the Four up like this, and with folks like you in the audience. Um, back in law school, when you took the essay exam, it, it was really a, a, a exercise in issue spot. And it, it give you this complicated fact pattern, and if you got all the issues, you know, you would get seven out of ten points just for identifying the issues. And then if you wrote pretty well and organized it well, you might get another couple points. And then if you were right in your answer, you might get a tenth point. You know, at the end of the day, uh, it was just the, 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 the getting the right answer at that point was almost an afterthought. Where we are now with Spectrum, frankly, I, I'm just really enthusiastic that folks like Richard and ITIF and the PCAS and lots of other folks are identifying the issues and putting them out there for debate. Um, and I think uh, it is a, um, uh, a question of uh, multiple tools at our disposal and pursuing multiple avenues to solve this problem. Uh, sharing, uh, as well as exclusive license Spectrum, um, unlicensed Spectrum, uh, it's all of the above, as, as uh, a couple of the panels have said. And you know, from the administration standpoint, since the president put out his memorandum of June of, 20, June of 2010, uh, the, the, the uh, NTIA and the agencies they've been working with uh, have, have looked at the 3550 ban, uh, the 1695 ban, those were the first two uh, almost two years ago. 
Um, the, the 1755 band has gotten probably the most attention, certainly the most interest from the commercial side. There are now five uh, working groups looking at that because there are uh, 3,200 assignments, uh, federal assignments in the 1755 to 1850 band, so you need a lot of different teams because those mm -hmm. assignments uh, cover all sorts of different types of systems that need to be solved. Uh, and, and again, they're looking at sharing, but, but the report, the 1755 report, specifically said, here are systems that could be clear. Um, uh, they're also looking at the 5 gigahertz band, which is a, 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 presumably going to be a license service. Um, when T-Mobile stepped up on behalf of the uh, industry and said, uh, let's look at testing uh, of sharing opportunities in the vicinity of actual federal systems, the Defense Department responded and has uh, offered a list of uh, sites where that could happen. We had the legislation, which uh, it, in addition to authorizing and funding and providing spectrum for the public safety broadband network, also created opportunities for commercial use of that spectrum, as uh, I think Richard described earlier, the, the auctions that the FCC is working on uh, and sending commercial providers of non-broadband services to uh, make that available for broadband. So I do think it is, it is all uh, hands on deck uh, and, and then all of the above approach. Um, and when it comes to the technology, again, it's, there are lots of approaches here, but we've had exclusion zones uh, uh, for a long time. That's a form of sharing. Uh, databases and white spaces that the FCC is uh, pursuing now and implementing now. Uh, you get to some of the more advanced um, uh, technologies, the dynamic sharing, uh, the radios, uh, perhaps do uh, more emphasis on, on different architectures involving small cells. Um, there's, a, there's a sentence in, in uh, the report that says policy has to work with reality. And I think that's exactly right. And I think as we do that, and as we work through all of these different options, uh, we will find ourselves uh, eventually getting to the right solution. I mean, physics at the end of the day is what's going to dictate this. Um, uh, so I think when we talk about these reports that, that, that at some level seem to be competing, I don't know that they really are. I think it's more nuance and emphasis and timing. And, uh, and when I talk about timing, I know that the report uh, uh, the ITIF report at one point uh, says, the prudent course is to deal with today's problem today while actively supporting the technology that we will use tomorrow. Makes sense. Uh, there's a quote attributed to Marty Cooper where he basically says it's hard to look out more than three years given the rapid pace of technology. And then the report concludes that says uh, we should be adopting principles that reflect the best understanding of spectrum usage uh, technology as it is today and as it will be in the next five to ten years. So I agree with all that. And it's just a matter of, you know, what is coming into focus uh, right now, what's coming into focus uh, a little bit farther out the horizon, and, and then how much emphasis we put on things that are five to ten years out. I, I, those are all reasonable time frames. The president's memorandum from, from two years ago recognized that. He said, let's find 500 uh, megahertz of federal non federal spectrum that could be made available for wireless broadband within ten years. Uh, obviously, we want to make uh, as much of that as available as soon as possible, but the recognition was it would be 10 years to success there. Um, uh, I guess the only other uh, point I would touch on is um, in terms of uh, efficiencies or inefficiencies of existing government uses, surely uh, uh, improvements could be made. Uh, Richard made the point that not all uses have to be via spectrum just because they are via spectrum today. Um, the GAO report from a couple years ago recognized that uh, there were agencies that had assignments that they weren't using anymore and had not turned in, and it all gets back to this issue of incentives, which, uh, you know, Richard pointed out, this is a tough, uh, a tough thing for the agencies. It's not that they don't respond to incentives, they <coughs> don't provide them incentives the way commercial folks do have incentives. Uh, the recent legislation helped this a lot uh, by allowing uh, uh, essentially expanded uh, use of the Spectrum Education Fund so that uh, agencies, when they do, uh, relocate and use funding not simply to get back to the status quo, but to actually invest in even better uh, hardware and software so that there's actually an upside for them. I think uh, the PCAST report uh, does a good job of looking at this too. It sort of acknowledges the, the basic challenge, but then talks about a, a spectrum currency, which is kind of a shadow currency that uh, would measure efficiency gains and allow uh, agencies to, to translate those. Uh, uh, efficiency gains and things like the currency, which they can turn into the real revenue. Uh, a lot of details we worked out there. Uh, but I guess at the end, in, in the interest of time, this is the end. Um, I'll simply say I, I, do, uh, I do think, I, I remain optimistic. I think uh, there's actually a lot of consensus up here. Um, uh, and, and we find uh, 
you know, we're, we're driven to find ways to disagree with each other, but I do think, uh, I do think, uh, you know, it, it, there's, there's physics and there's time, and there's uh, uh, only uh, so many variables we have. So uh, I appreciate, uh, Richard, the, the report, the opportunity to be here, and uh, the comments of my colleagues here. So I'm here to talk about why, why this is happening. Why are we here, sitting in this room, sweating it out? Oh, we got our air conditioning. I've got about five minutes. My folks are the implementers of all of this spectrum. We make the mobile apps that you all have. I don't even need to show of hands to guess that pretty much everybody here has a smartphone at one level or another that deals at some level or another with applications on it. And those applications use up spectrum like nobody's business. As you heard, as you read, we've seen spectrum increases of 9,000%. 9,000%. And that's awesome. Because that means jobs. My folks make the apps that run on your phones, that, that allow them to hire more people, that allow them to build entirely new business models in this platform and in this space. So I thought it was interesting that Preston talked about a bow wave, because I, I'm actually a sailor also, Preston, and one of the things that I know what you do when you have a bow wave if you're, if you're in a sink pot is you add more power. And so when I'm, when I'm thinking about how we move forward to this pressure, I'm telling you right now that those of you who are from congressional offices, you're going to see more pressure because the apps that our folks are creating, the next big wave of those apps, they're not happening at 99 cent apps playing words with friends. They're not game apps, they're not angry birds. They're in the medical health space. They're in the enterprise space. This device and devices like this are moving to every factory floor in the United States. Every hospital is adopting devices like this. Every business is adopting devices like this. And every app that runs on them uses Spectrum. I thought it was great that Richard K. Paper talks about the difference between nomadic uses, like Wi-Fi, and mobile. And so I think what we have to realize from Richard's paper is, is that we need to understand that the bow wave of pressure that Preston may feel um, from government agencies saying, no, it's mine, it's mine, well, there's going to be a bow wave of pressure from constituents on members of Congress and members of the administration to say, hey, wait a minute. I want more of this awesomeness in my office. I want more of this awesomeness in my hospital. I want more of this awesomeness in my rural locations. And what I know from many years of sailing and even driving St. pots is what you need to do is add power. And so in that case, I really like the fact that the PCAST report, the PCAST report and others talk about ways to develop new threads. My only concern about the PCAST report is, as Preston uh, pointed out, was well, we've done this report, we've already talked about the need to get more free and clear, so I'm going to focus on this thread. My only concern is that people focus only on the new thread element and pretend as though the free and clear, the clearing, isn't part of the debate. It's, we all know that, that shaping the memo often shape, shapes the way people view things. So I think what's really important as we look at both the PCAST report and as, Robert, uh, as, as Richard's paper is we understand that these are going to shape the way we think about it. And so we need to take that additional thread and move it forward. There are two things that I think that are worth mentioning as we look at this from the mobile apps perspective. Um, Richard talks about uh, finding a good balance on the number of competitors. My only concern is from a movie analogy, I, I don't want us to end up um, in a Highlander as the government's starting to say there can be only three. You know, I think we need to recognize that uh, we're going to probably have a, a growing and shrinking number of competitors in the spectrum space. There are going to be um, licensors of three, four, down to, you know, down to three, up to six, and it needs to be flexible. I don't think the government should be setting the number of competitors in that space. I think that raises risk. The other thing was, I thought Tom, uh, Tom, Thomas brought up a great point about predictiveness. Um, I, I realized there was so much discussion in, in Richard's report and others about this 10-year window. I want to show all of you what was the biggest selling phone 10 years ago. It's a Nokia, 137 million of those sold. Leo, hold up your current phone. Not 137 million. Not 130, they, they want to sell 137 million. That's the new device. This one, very cute, doesn't use up a lot of spectrum. That one does. So as we think about the way we're going on this, we need to remember that um, your constituents are driving the pressure on that bow wave. And the fact that government agencies are concerned about uh, finding ways to get it clear in, in a timely fashion, tough. This is the time where the government has to put more power on it and start understanding that the needs are changing and that the constituents that they represent 
have new requirements in ways that will create jobs and create entirely new ways for us to, to face uh, problems that we, didn't, uh, that we haven't had solutions to in the past. So I'm really cutting mine short because we're down to 35 seconds. So I, uh, I, uh, I like what you did, Richard, and there's a lot of good stuff in there. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Richard.